episode 25. Once in the shop, Harry whipped off the invisibility cloak, hid it in his bag, and joined in with the other two when they insisted, in answer to Mrs. Weasley's accusations, that they had been in the back room all along, and that she could not have looked properly. Chapter 7. The Slug Club. Harry spent a lot of time the last week of the holidays pondering the meaning of Malfoy's behavior in Nocturne Alley. What disturbed him most was the satisfied look on Malfoy's face as he had left the shop. Nothing that made Malfoy look that happy could be good news. To his slight annoyance, however, neither Ron nor Hermione seemed quite as curious about Malfoy's activities as he was, or at least they seemed to get bored of discussing it after a few days. Yes, I've already agreed it was fishy, Harry, said Hermione a little impatiently. She was sitting on the window sill in Fred and George's room with her feet up on one of the cardboard boxes and had only grudgingly looked up from her new copy of Advanced Rune Translation. But haven't we agreed there could be a lot of explanations? Maybe he's broken his hand of glory, said Ron vaguely as he attempted to straighten his broomstick's bent tail twigs. Remember that shriveled up arm Malfoy had? But what about when he said, don't forget to keep that one safe, asked Harry for the umpteenth time. That sounded to me like Borgen's got another one of the broken objects, and Malfoy wants both. You reckon, said Ron, now trying to scrape some dirt off his broom handle. Yeah, I do, said Harry. When neither Ron nor Hermione answered, he said, Malfoy's father's in Azkaban. Don't you think Malfoy'd like revenge? Ron looked up, blinking. Malfoy? Revenge? What can he do about it? That's my point. I don't know, said Harry, frustrated. But he's up to something, and I think we should take it seriously. His father's a Death Eater, and... Harry broke off, his eyes fixed on the window behind Hermione, his mouth open. A startling thought had just occurred to him. Harry, said Hermione in an anxious voice, what's wrong? Your scar's not hurting again, is it? asked Ron nervously. He's a death eater, said Harry slowly. He's replaced his father as a death eater. There was a silence. Then Ron erupted in laughter. <laughs> Malfoy? He's 16, Harry. You think you know who would let Malfoy join? It seems very unlikely, Harry, said Hermione in a repressive sort of voice. What makes you think? In Madame Malkins. She didn't touch him, but he yelled and jerked his arm away from her when she went to roll up his sleeve. It was his left arm. He's been branded with the dark mark. Ron and Hermione looked at each other. Well, said Ron, sounding thoroughly unconvinced. I think he just wanted to get out of there, Harry, said Hermione. He showed Borgen something we couldn't see, Harry pressed on stubbornly. Something that seriously scared Borgen. It was the mark. I know it. He was showing Borgen who he was dealing with. You saw how seriously Borgen took him. Ron and Hermione exchanged another look. I'm not sure, Harry. Yeah, I still don't reckon you know who would let Malfoy join. Annoyed, but absolutely convinced he was right, Harry snatched up a pile of filthy Quidditch robes and left the room. Mrs. Weasley had been urging them for days not to leave their washing and packing until the last moment. On the landing, he bumped into Ginny, who was returning to her room carrying a pile of freshly laundered clothes. I wouldn't go in the kitchen just now, she warned him. There's a lot of phlegm around. I'll be careful not to slip in it, Harry smiled. Sure enough, when he entered the kitchen, it was to find Fleur sitting at the kitchen table in full flow about plans for her wedding to Bill while Mrs. Weasley kept watch over a pile of self-peeling sprouts, looking bad-tempered. 
Bilenaria Valmus decided on only two bridesmaids. Ginny and Gabrielle will look very sweet together. I am thinking of dressing them in pale gold. Pink would, of course, be horrible with Ginny's hair. Ah, Harry, said Mrs. Weasley, loudly, cutting across Fleur's monologue. Good, I wanted to explain about the security arrangements for the journey to Hogwarts tomorrow. We've got ministry cars again, and there will be auras waiting at the station. Is Tonks going to be there? asked Harry, handing over his Quidditch things. No, I don't think so. She's been stationed somewhere else, from what Arthur said. She has let herself go, that Tonks. Fleur mused, examining her own stunning reflection in the back of a teaspoon. A big mistake, if you ask me. Yes, thank you, said Mrs. Weasley, tartly, cutting across Fleur again. You'd better get on, Harry. I want the trunks ready tonight, if possible, so we don't have the usual last-minute scramble. And, in fact, their departure the following morning was smoother than usual, the ministry cars glided up to the front of the burrow to find them waiting. Trunks packed, Hermione's cat, Crookshanks, safely enclosed in his traveling basket, and Hedwig, Ron's owl, Pigwidgeon, and Ginny's new purple pygmy puff, Arnold, in cages. Au revoir, Harry, said Fleur throatily, kissing him goodbye. Ron hurried forward, looking hopeful, but Ginny stuck out her foot, and Ron fell, sprawling in the dust at Fleur's feet. Furious, red face, and dirt spattered, he hurried into the car without saying goodbye. There was no cheerful Hagrid waiting for them at King's Cross Station. Instead, two grim-faced, bearded aurors in dark muggle suits moved forward the moment the car stopped, and, flanking the party, marched them into the station without speaking. Quick, quick, through the barrier, said Mrs. Weasley, who seemed a little flustered by this austere efficiency. Harry had better go first, with... Uh, she looked inquiringly at one of the aurors who nodded briefly, seized Harry's upper arm and attempted to steer him toward the barrier between platforms nine and ten. I can walk, thanks, said Harry irritably, jerking his arm out of the aura's grip. He pushed his trolley directly at the solid barrier, ignoring his silent companion, and found himself a second later standing on platform nine and three quarters where the scarlet Hogwarts Express stood belching steam over the crowd. Hermione and the Weasleys joined him within seconds. Without waiting to consult his grim-faced aura, Harry motioned to Ron and Hermione to follow him up the platform, looking for an empty compartment. We can't, Harry, said Hermione, looking apologetic. Ron and I've got to go to the prefect's carriage first and then patrol the corridors for a bit. Oh, yeah, I forgot, said Harry. You'd better get straight on the train, all of you. You've only got a few minutes to go, said Mrs. Weasley, consulting her watch. Well, have a lovely term, Ron. Mr. Weasley, can I have a quick word, said Harry, making up his mind on the spur of the moment. Of course, said Mr. Weasley, who looked slightly surprised, but followed Harry out of earshot of the others, nevertheless. Harry had thought it through carefully and come to the conclusion that if he was to tell anyone, Mr. Weasley was the right person. Firstly, because he worked at the ministry and was therefore in the best position to make further investigations. And secondly, because he thought there was not too much risk of Mr. Weasley exploding with anger. He could see Mrs. Weasley and the grim-faced Auror casting the pair of them suspicious looks as they moved away. When we were in Diagon Alley, Harry began, but Mr. Weasley forestalled him with a grimace. Am I about to discover where you, Ron, and Hermione disappeared to while you were supposed to be in the back room of Fred and George's shop? How did you... Harry, please, you're talking to the man who raised Fred and George. Uh, yeah. All right, we weren't in the back room. Very well, then. Let's hear the worst. Well, we followed Draco Malfoy. We use my invisibility cloak. Did you have any particular reason for doing so, or was it a mere whim? 